Hello, and welcome to this video covering the new developer experience introduced in Sitecore 10. In this video, we're going to take a look at how you can integrate Docker into a Visual Studio solution. Now, this should be equally applicable if you're working on a new build or if you're upgrading an older version of Sitecore to V10 and looking to leverage the new Docker-based deployment approaches as part of the process. So we're going to take a look at a few different things in this video. We're going to look at the target architecture you're going to be creating. We're going to look at how you can utilize images, containers, and environments as part of this process. I'm going to cover some best practices you should follow when trying to build your images. And then we'll take a look at a real solution where this has all been put into action. So let's start off by taking a quick look at the target architecture we're going to be creating. In this example, we're going to be working with a typical Sitecore 10 XM deployment. If you take a look at this diagram, you can see that this will involve eight different containers that come together to provide each of the different application elements required. So each of these containers that you create will be based on an image. But where do these images come from? Well, we're going to have to create these images. So how do we go about achieving that? If we look at the Docker documentation, it gives us the following explanation of how container images are built. In our scenario, we're going to use a couple of different approaches. We're going to be directly using pre-built images for some of the architecture elements. And for others, we're going to be building our own custom images, including our solution and customizations required for our implementation. But once we've created them, well, then we need to actually start to create some containers based on them. And we're going to use a tool called Docker Compose to do that. And it's going to combine them all together into a fully working architecture. Using Docker Compose is typically a three-step process. You begin by creating different Docker files that are basically manifests for how each of your images are going to be created. After that, we create a YAML file called a Docker Compose file, which defines a list of services that can all be run together in isolation. Finally, we're going to use a CLI to stand up that Docker Compose architecture and run the entire Sitecore system as a whole. Another thing we're going to want to leverage when creating our Docker Compose files is the concept of environment variables. And these are exposed through a .env file. These basically allow you to use variables within your definition to share values between the different services. And this is super helpful. So things like if you want to specify isolation modes across your entire architecture, maybe the location of your cycle license file or different registry details and the like. It also means you can have different environment files for different environments you're deploying to, allowing you to reuse your Docker Compose files much more easily. Okay, so we know roughly that we need to build some images and that they're going to be used to create the containers we need to run. But there are different approaches you can take to building images. So let's take a look at some of the recommended best practices you should try and follow. So the first area we're going to focus on is around image size. You should always try and ensure your images are as small as possible. And there are some tips you can follow to achieve that. The first is to make sure you use the smallest size base image possible. There are various different Windows and Linux base images available. And you need to make sure you choose the smallest one that gives you the functionality set you need. Next, you want to leverage what are called multi-stage builds. This means you can create different artifacts and select what you do and don't want to use in your final image to keep the size down. A typical example for this is with building your solution. You could just build an image based on top of the .NET SDK that you're going to use to build the solution but it includes a lot of other elements that you don't actually need. What you want to do is you want to create what's known as an intermediary image, which will perform the build for you against the .NET SDK base image. After that, you can basically take the output from that build and create a new image based on top of the much more lightweight .NET runtime base image. This means you don't get all the overhead of the SDK in the actual image you're going to be using at runtime. Next up, you should be making use of Docker ignore files. Now these work in a very similar way to git ignore files. They basically tell Docker not to copy any of these files into a container. Again, helping you to cut down on the image size. Finally, you want to minimize your layer count. Introducing each new layer includes a small overhead 
So you want to try and condense down the number of layers as much as you can where it makes sense. So getting your image size down is one thing, but you also need to make sure you're increasing your image build speed where possible as well. Because that's going to give you a much faster feedback loop when working with these. And again, there are some things you can follow to achieve that. Much like you would do in your code, you want to aim for a dry approach for your Docker builds as well. If the output from your solution is needed in multiple containers, you don't want to build it individually each time, as that's going to introduce unnecessary overhead. Instead, you want to build your solution once and then share that output between all the different images that need it. The next two are kind of linked. Leveraging layer caching and the orders of layers are very important. You want to ensure that you're only rebuilding the layers of your build definition that you need to, and you're not performing a complete rebuild each time. A good example of this is around NuGet restores. You'll be using a clean base image every time, so there's no NuGet cache, meaning the restore can be quite a time intensive part of the build. You get around this by performing the NuGet restore in isolation before you copy in your source files. This means that unless you add a new NuGet reference, you don't need to do the restore again every time. The action will be cached and it won't be performed every time you build the image. You should also be very specific and targeted about what assets you're copying into your image with each copy command. These will all be tied to the cache of that layer, so adding any unnecessary files into the image increases the chance of the cache being invalidated and that step of the build having to be performed again. Okay, so we've covered a lot of topics in these slides. Let's take a look at how you can leverage all of these concepts when integrating Docker into your solution. Okay, so I've loaded up VS Code here, and I just want to show you how Docker has been integrated into this solution. If we look in the root, we can see there's a Docker folder in here. And in here, we have a build folder. This build folder contains a series of different Docker files controlling how each of these different images are going to be built. We have a deploy folder. This is where the output of the solution is published to when I run a publish within Visual Studio. This is volumed into the container, allowing us to perform publishes to our content management and content delivery once the container's up and running. We also have a traffic folder in here, which contains a few certificates and configuration handling how traffic works. Before I dig too much into those build definitions though, I just want to take a look in this Docker Compose file in the root. As I mentioned, the Docker Compose file is a YAML document, and it contains a series of service definitions. Each of those eight containers we saw in that architecture diagram before will have its own service definition in here. If we look at the first one, we can see the definition for traffic, the reverse proxy handling all ingress into these containers. And you can start to see an example of when environment variables are used as well. If we look at the isolation parameter and the image parameter, Wherever you see this dollar and bracket notation, this signifies that these values are going to be replaced at runtime by an environment variable. There's a series of other settings for traffic, controlling things like what ports are mapped and some volumes which are pushed in as well. Moving further down, we can start to see where the sidecar containers come in. Next up, we have Redis. Redis controls the session state for our content delivery instance. Then we have our SQL container and our solar container. And throughout all of these, you can see different examples of environment variables being passed in. With all three of these, you'll notice that they're actually not built containers. There's no build section here. There's a direct reference to an existing image. What that means is that these images won't be built when I run a build command. We're going to use a predefined image and just stand it up as is. Now, you'll probably want to do that most of the time for these. But with SQL and Solar, there may be instances where you don't. Say, for example, you have a custom database that you need to deploy to SQL, or if you have a custom index that's required by our implementation. In these scenarios, then you'd probably end up creating your own image, which would take the base images we're using and insert a fresh layer with the customizations in. Looking at the next image, this is the identity server image called ID. And here we can start to see a series of more environment variables being passed in. Things like URLs to access the CM host, we have identity secret values. We have site called license locations and the like being configured as well. What you'll notice here now is we also have a labels section, and this is how you configure traffic. So you can see the identity server has traffic enabled. This tells traffic that it needs to handle and pass the requests 
through. We enable it with the first parameter. We make sure that it's secure. We also set the actual host that it's going to be running on. So we pass that in again from an environment variable. And then we enable TLS for this traffic because we want it to run over HTTPS. Now this is the last of the actual pre-built image containers. All the rest of the containers we're going to look at are going to be built by commands. Now, as we mentioned in the previous slides, you want to keep your build process dry. You don't want to repeat yourself. We could build this solution for our CD image, then build it again for our CM image, then build it again for our rendering host image. But that introduces a lot of unnecessary overhead. Instead, what we've introduced is this solution build output image. Its sole responsibility is to take the solution here, build it, and make the output of that solution available to the other build processes. So you can see here, this is our first example of a built image, and we have a build node here. This specifies the context where it's gonna be run. It specifies the specific Docker file which is gonna get executed as part of the build. And then we pass in some variables which are gonna be used in that build file. So things like the solution base image, the build image, that's the image we're going to use to actually build the solution. There's a net core build image. This solution contains code that needs to be output to the net framework and to net core. So we're going to make use of both of those. Then we have some versioning info as well. What happens when that's complete? That then enables us to build the other images. Next up, we have our rendering image. Here you can see we're again specifying the location of a Docker file that we want to execute for it. We're mapping some ports. And we've set some dependencies again. We're saying the rendering host needs the solution build output to exist as it's going to use that as part of its output. Again, we've specified some traffic labels. We've specified this is enabled for traffic. We've set it to be secure and again, set the host value that it's going to receive traffic on. Moving on, we next have our CD image. This is going to build the image used for our content delivery instance. Again, we specify a specific Docker file location that's going to be used. We pass in some arguments that are going to be used in the Docker file. Then we set a various set of environments variables. These are used at runtime, things like connection string data, the solar location and the like. And we're also going to set some volumes for this too. That deploy folder we looked at before, that's how we're going to handle deployments from our solution once this container is running. You can see that's been volumed into the source directory here. We're also voluming in our license. You don't want to include the license in your baked image as it makes it quite painful to update if you need to. You want to pass the license data in through a volume and an environment like we're doing here. Finally, we're specifying the development entry point, which provides functionality for you to deploy code into this container. The final container we have is our content management container. And this is very similar to the CD one. Again, we're specifying a location of a Docker file we're going to execute. We're configuring the environment variables we're going to run at runtime. We're configuring some traffic labels again. And once more, we're voluming in that source directory to allow us to push code into there once it's actually up and running. So before I go and take a look at the actual build files themselves, I just want to take a look at this environment variable first. We looked at a lot of different services there, and there were a lot of different environment variables specified. This end file is where you set the actual values to be replaced. So we can see things like the isolation mode. We can see the site core version. We can see the different image versions we're going to use for things like Redis, Solo, and all of the other base images we need. We have various secrets in there, things like your admin password and ID secret. And finally, all those different host values as well, the ones we're sending up in traffic to allow requests to be passed through. So now we've taken a look at the Docker Compose and the environment, let's actually start to look at some of these Docker files. Let's see how these images are built. Now, the four image builds we have are for content delivery, content management, the rendering host, and that solution build that I mentioned before, which allows us to only do the build once and not have to repeat it. I'm going to start off with the solution build, as that has to happen before the other three. So here you can see the Docker file to build the solution. And each one of these commands represents a different activity that needs to perform. Here you can see we start off with the arguments that are passed in, the different base images we required throughout. What we do then is, we're going to start off by setting this up to do a NuGet restore. Remember I talked before about the importance of layer caching? Well, in this case, what we want to do is we want to include everything we can to perform a NuGet restore before we copy the source in. So what we're doing is 
these sets of commands here are going to copy in things like my packages config and all of the CS proj files required by my solution. After that, we take all of the .NET Core assets required too, and we pass those into the same container. From there, once we have all of this configured, we can then run a .NET restore, which will pull down all of the different assets that we need for both the .NET Core application and my .NET Framework application. You'll notice that this happens before the copy command for the source directory. This means that all of this down to line 50 will be cached and it'll only get invalidated when I change one of the CS proj files or the packages config and the like. That means that I won't have to perform that NuGet restore, which can be quite expensive every time I change a source file. So we've completed the package restore. Next, we copy in all of our source code. Then we run a main build of the actual application to publish out the .NET framework assets. And they're going to go into that deploy folder we mentioned earlier. After that, we run a .NET publish, which is going to publish out my rendering host, the .NET Core application. And we set it to go to this build rendering folder. The final thing we do is we start a new image. Remember we talked before about multi-stage builds. This is an example of it. Our base image here is going to be clean. We create a folder in there called artifacts. And all we copy in is the output of the deploy of the .NET framework assets and the output of the deploy of the .NET Core assets. So we're keeping it as lightweight as possible. And there we have it. We have built our solution. Let's hop over to one of our first Sitecore instances and see how we make use of it. I'm going to load up the content delivery one first. And you can see, because we've moved that solution build functionality out of here, it's kept this really clean. We're basically starting off with three images we're going to use here. We're going to take the solution image we just looked through. We're going to take a tooling image. This is one that's provided by Sitecore and has things like the watch directory script and the like used for deployments. And we take a base image. In this case, this is the base content delivery image provided by Sitecore for version 10. We move along and we set our working directory to be our dubdub root folder. Currently, we just have a base image. So all it has in there is the standard Sitecore content delivery assets. What we do is next, we need to copy in the output from the tooling image. So that's going to give us all of the watch directory functionality. It's all going to get copied into a tools folder in the root of the image. Finally, we copy in our actual website asset files. This is the output of the solution build we just did previously containing all of the .NET framework code. We can take a look at the content management one as well. And it's pretty much identical. The base image parameter here will be different. It's going to be using the content management base image instead of the content delivery base image. But apart from that, it's the same. The last one we're going to take a look at is the rendering build. Here we're taking in the solution image again that we built earlier. And we're going to just use a clean .NET Core runtime image. This is the clean .NET Core image provided by Microsoft. So all we have to do is copy in the assets we built before. We expose some ports that are running. And then we actually run the .NET runtime and pass in the DLL of our site, telling it to execute it. OK, so that's kind of a lot to go through and cover. I think it's probably about time we saw some of this in action. I'm going to bring up a terminal window. and. First of all, I'm going to do the build. I'm going to use Docker Compose, and I'm going to use the build command. This is going to now take that Docker Compose file we looked at at the start, and it's going to build all of the services which require building. So you can see it says that some of the services use an image, and it skips those. Well, things like the solution output, the CD image, the CM image, my rendering host. It's going to go through and perform the build actions required for all of these. So that build's completed. And now all we need to do is run a docker compose up. I'm going to run it in disconnected mode. So there we have it. Docker's now brought up a series of containers based on those images that we just created. If I run a docker ps-a, here you can see all the different containers up and running. I have my rendering host. You can see traffics in there, my content delivery, content management, and all the others specified as the different services in that Docker Compose file. So hopefully that's given you a good introduction on how you can integrate Docker into your solution today. You can see some links above for further reading on some of the topics here. Thanks for watching and don't forget to follow the Learn Cycle hashtag for future videos.